Thank you. Thanks. So I guess it's time, at least on one computer, it's time to start. Well, you want to meet, you need to go out? OK. So what to, where we were yesterday, we had introduced this contact force, which is force per unit area. We also call it surface tractions. And we showed that the balance of linear momentum or conservation of linear momentum, which is really Newton's second law of motion, written for a continuum, that implies that this f should be a linear function of n. Okay. That means this f depends upon the orientation of the surface through the unit normal n. But more important is that this f is a linear function of n. So we can write f in this form. And then we said this fi is called Cauchy stress tensor. Now, some people also call this true stress tensor. So if you read a book on plasticity, you are more likely to see the word true stress rather than the Cauchy stress. The, the, the phrase true refers to the fact that you have present force per unit present area. When you do an experiment in the mechanics of materials lab, most of the time, most of the time, you measure the diameter of the rod or the specimen before you start loading it. If you divide the present force by the undeformed area, that's the area of cross-section before you start loading it. That is not true stress. Okay. We will come to that in a little while. So that is called like engineering stress. If you divide the present force, now this is again the same loosely, because the reason I'm saying that this is not quite strictly speaking correct, even though we use it all the time. If you divide by present area, and I will ask you this question in the exam. So I will, those of you who are doing PhD, you can expect this in the preliminary exam. Otherwise, you can expect this question in the second test, as well as the final exam. So don't blame me if I ask you and then you say you did not teach us. So this is called true stress or Cauchy stress. This is not, the reason I'm saying this is not quite correct is the following. Force is a vector and area of cross section is a, is a vector. How many of you have learned to divide force by, to divide one vector by another vector? I think most of you have learned or have seen vector algebra. So how many of you have learned how to divide a force, like how to divide one vector by another vector? At least I have not learned. I mean, I'm much older than you are. I have not learned yet how to divide one vector by another vector. So that's why this definition I wrote, present force over present area, is loose. It's not strictly speaking mathematical. We cannot divide a vector by another vector. Whenever we say something like this, we have a fixed area in mind. Like we have the surface basically fixed. And then we say, okay, we are talking about unit area on that surface. Then it's a scalar quantity. But otherwise, you are dividing one vector by another vector, and none of us knows how to do it. So keep that in mind. If you, if I change the present area to undeformed area, or area in the undeformed shape,
which will be the same thing as saying reference configuration, then this true will become in general. So the true stress will become engineering stress, which we also sometimes called, call nominal stress. So either is called engineering stress or is called nominal stress. Now if the deformations are small, which means you are talking about strains of the order of 0.1% or less, maybe 1% at most, the change in the area is not much. Okay, if you are talking about strains of the order of say 0.1%, then the change in the area is going to be roughly 0.1 square, which is 0.01%. And the error introduced by dividing either by the present area or the area in the undeformed shape is very small. Okay, so we may not worry about it, but try to pull your skin, okay, which is the famous example. And although I, I give you that example all the time. Like John McCain says, Joe Plummer, um, I um, mostly say, pull your skin. Okay? So if you pull your skin, the strain is not 0.1%. Strain is much larger. And in that case, it will make a lot of difference whether you divide by the present area or the undeformed area. Like area and the, there's a seat here. There's a, here. So if, if you divide by either by the unde area and the undeformed state or the deformed state, it will make a difference. So it depends. If you are working with polymers or rubber-like materials or soft tissues, like in biomechanics, of course, you work with so soft tissues. So anything that deforms a lot, you have to be very careful whether you divide by the present area or the area and the undeformed state. Okay, so let's look at again this TIJ. The reason I keep on emphasizing it because this thing is very important and we should know. So this is what we call TIJ. So you keep X fixed. X is a point in the present configuration. So let's now if I set i equal to, sorry, j equal to 1, so I'm fixing the normal. I'm fixing the plane on which we are going to find surface tractions or force per unit area. So which plane are we talking about now? And let me draw the coordinates. So this is say x1 x2, x3. So which plane we are talking about? X2, X3 plane. X2, X3 plane. The no outward normal to X2, X3 plane is E1, the unit vector in along the X1 axis. So that means we are talking about this plane. Now in this plane, the the surface traction has three components, like i equal to 1, i equal to 2, i equal to 3. So i equal to 1, no, it depends which side you are looking at. If i is equal to 1 is positive, if f1 is positive, so that will be t11. Because i equal to 1, i equal to 2, will give us this, so that's T12. I equal to 3 will give us T13. So the way I have drawn it, the my positive quantities are pointing along the positive coordinate axis. And basically, my body is on this side because my positive normal is along the X1 axis. Okay, so the if if you are looking at the body, it's really in the x2, x3 plane, but this x2, x3 plane is the right edge or right surface of the body. 
not the left surface. Okay. Theoretically, we have a like this. We have just one plane. But if you think of this as the as the boundary of a body, then the rest of the body is on the left side. And I think now you can recognize this. What is T11 and T12 and T13? So we call T11 as what? I like it. What is the adjective before stress? What is the word before stress we call for T11? Normal stress or axial stress? So T11 is the normal stress. T12 and T3, T13 are shear stresses. Okay, so T12 and T T13 are shear stresses, and T11 is the normal stress on the plane perpendicular to x1 axis or on the x1 plane. What about the the this plane? What is the normal to this plane? The what will be the normal to this plane? Outward normal. And again, my body is uh, like something is going down. Is it a hard question? What is the outward unit normal to the top surface? E2. E2. So, so on this plane, then the outward normal is E2. So I have will have T I2 is equal to F I x e2 and i should have put oh, tilde here because so x is a like a vector x x1 x2 x3 coordinates again t2 i has like i equal to 1 i equal to 2 i equal to 3 see if i take i equal to 1 i will get force in the one direction which will basically give me this quantity in the one direction so this is T21. If I put i equal to two, then I will get if in this direction. The length of the arrows has no meaning because we are not saying anything about the magnitude of T11, T12, T13, or T21. So the length of the arrows has no meaning. Only the direction is being shown. So this will be T22. And then T23, so that's in this direction. Yes. I have a question about the order of the indices on T. Like when you define T I1, uh -huh. shouldn't all of them on that plane be? Oh, I think I goofed. Second index. I goofed. It's my mistake. You are right. I goofed. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You are. It's good you caught it. I goofed. The second index should be one. So it should have been not. This should have been T21, T31. This should be T32, 12. Yeah, it's my mistake. Sorry. The second index is the the one pointing towards the normal. Now some books have the opposite, but that's not the way I defined it. So it was my mistake. It's not that I'm covering it up. It's my mistake, okay? Because the way I defined it, I should have these indices transposed. Because in my notation, the second index points to the normal. The first index gives the direction of the force. So the, the way our we are using the notation, the second index gives the normal, not the first index. The stress tensor is symmetric, so it I have not shown you yet here. And not every stress tensor is symmetric. First of all, I have not shown you that the stress tensor is symmetric. I mean, I was good, so it's not fair for me to use that argument because I goofed. Okay, so goof doesn't mean I can cover it up now. Okay, it was my mistake. Okay, so then we will have Ti3. And that will be F I X E three, and that will be the plane perpendicular to X three axis. So even though in the picture I have shown you here, 
this is my point x this plane and the top plane don't seem to be passing through that point x they actually are the only reason i showed you that uh, that plane bow is because i cannot show you in this horizontal direction the picture will be too much covered so when you look at the cube in your mechanics of deforms class that cube is really just for pictorial purposes the stresses are being shown at one point because we cannot pass six planes through the same point and show you which one is pointing in the x1 direction which one is pointing the negative x1 direction so that's why we draw the cube but all those six planes of that cube are passing through the same point we are showing you stresses at a point so this is stresses at a point okay the stress tensor is a function of this point now because direction we have already taken care of okay now so let's look at the balance of linear momentum we wrote before and that was d over dt of rho velocity times the volume element on part p equals rho b dv on part p plus f da on the boundaries that's what we wrote so this is the contact force that's the body force and we also said that this thing and now i'm going to write in indices for so i'm going to use indices so this vector i'm going to write in the like ith component so this is on part p so this body force again i write the ith component plus f i d a on the boundaries now i'm going to use this equation that f i actually not this one but this one that f i sorry this f i is equal to t i j and j i i hope you can see it see f i is t i j because this quantity in the green box is t i j that's what we defined so f i is t i j and j does it make sense so if we do that all i'm doing is using this equation that fi equals tij and j okay now assuming that this is okay i want to convert this to volume integral because this is what the left hand side is volume integral this term is volume integral so i want to convert that surface integration to volume integration and frances is looking at her notes now how to do it <laughs> and we have done it i mean at least you had a homework problem homework assignment number 1 problem number 5 you did something like this does anybody remember what we you did use the divergence theorem use the divergence theorem very good so josh remembers it use the divergence theorem and the divergence theorem says if you have the divergence theorem says that if you have a 
dotted with N on the boundaries, <coughs> then this is equal to divergence of A over the volume. Right? That's what the divergence theorem says. That if you have A dotted with N on the boundaries, which roughly means the flux coming through the boundaries is equal to the divergence of A over the volume. Now, what is A dot N in the index notation? In the index notation, this is AI and I. The A dot N is A I N I, right? A1 N1 plus A2 N2 plus A3 N3 or AX NX plus AY NY plus AZ NZ. What is divergence of A? That's delta A I over delta X I. That's like double delta AX over delta X plus delta AY over delta Y plus delta AZ over delta Z. Is it making sense? Because it, the next result is the most, well, when I keep on saying most important, but anyway, that's again one of the fundamental results. I think you have a question. I'm trying to figure out which these are the volumes and which ones are. Oh, the one with the curly thing is the volume, and the one without that curly is the velocity. Okay, so let's apply this divergence theorem to to this term. You see J and J here? That means inner product. Forget about the I part. Let's assume I is fixed. You see J and J? That is summation. So we can so that is the same thing as AI and I. Forget the I for the time being. So it's J and J. So so what we get then is rho, and now to make our friend happy, let's not write V, I. So let's write AI for acceleration, because rate of change of velocity is acceleration. Rate of change of velocity of a material particle of a material particle is acceleration. So that's rho B I D V plus delta T I J over delta X J D V. And all the integrations are on, on the volume now. Any questions about this? So the main thing is recognizing, observing that this J is summed. And that summation means now it's a dot product, which is the same thing as saying A dot N. And if it is A dot N, we can use the divergence theorem which means delta AI over delta XI over the volume. That's what we are doing here. Okay. So, so what we have done is, let's write this on one side. So I can, do you want me to take this to the right side or bring the other to the left side? It's the same thing. Which one do you prefer? But I can take this to the other side or I can bring both of them to the left side. It's the same thing, okay? So let's say is, is we have to put only one negative sign. Um, it doesn't say me much in button. So minus rho i plus rho b i plus delta t i j over delta x j. D. This is one part. So zero equal to that. 
The next argument is that in our body, when we took this part P, this part P is arbitrary. The size of the part P is arbitrary. You can choose, you can make it small, you can make it large, whatever you like. Okay? Remember, this is, the part P is arbitrary. That is the main, main thing we are going to use now. So if this integral vanishes for every part P, what should happen to the integrand? Okay. If this thing is true for every P, what should happen to the integrand? Okay. So I don't think it's making much sense yet. So let me give you this argument. Instead of writing all this stuff, let me just say I have F here. And this is true for every part P. So claim is that F is zero. F must be zero. So this is true, again, the key word is for every P. This is true if and only if F is zero. One part is clear. If f is 0, this integral is 0. So no, no sweat. The other part is, if this integral is 0, is f 0? And the answer is the, yes. The proof is the following. Let's assume that f is not 0. So it's either positive or negative. OK? So either it's positive or negative. So if, if at this point x, if at this point f is positive, and this continuous function, so it cannot become suddenly zero or negative. If it's positive, it suddenly cannot become zero. So it's positive over a small portion, over a tiny portion around that point. Remember, if it's positive at a point, the, at the next point, it cannot be zero. It's a continuous function. I mean, if the function is discontinuous, yes. But this is a continuous function. And therefore, I can take now, if, it's, if f is positive on this portion, I can take this tiny piece as my p. Okay, I can take that the black colored portion as my p. Remember, p is arbitrary. So my integral will not be zero then because I'm integrating something positive over a small area. So therefore, this integral must be zero. And that means rho a i must equal rho b i plus delta t i j over delta x j. That's because this integrand is zero, so I take back my rho a i to the left side. And this is called Cauchy's first law of motion. Well, not, sorry, not first law, but Cauchy's law of motion, not first. Or this is called conservation of linear momentum. Or this is called balance of linear momentum. So it depends whose paper you read. If you read my paper, it probably says balance of linear momentum. If you read probably Marx Kramer's paper, it will say conservation of linear momentum. But it's the same thing. Okay? It's the same thing. B different authors use different words, like conservation of linear momentum, linear momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity. So what it expresses is that the linear momentum is conserved, or the rate of change of linear momentum. That's what we wrote, the first equation. The rate of change of linear momentum equals the resultant force acting on the body. And in the local form, it becomes this equation. You have come across this equation, so don't don't feel that you have never come across this equation. Okay? Ai is the acceleration. That's the rate of change of velocity of a material particle. If you are in the 
spatial configuration. When you take little x and time as independent variables, then this is delta vi over delta x j vj. equals rho b i plus delta t i j over delta x j. So in, in fluid mechanics, now those of you who are in fluid mechanics, maybe I'm going a little too fast, so let me let you copy it down. Okay, so irrespective of the fluid you are talking about, whether it's Navier-Stokes or not Navier-Stokes, whether it's perfect or viscous, this term is the challenging term in fluid mechanics. It's a nonlinear term. If you double the velocity, this term will become four times. If you double the velocity everywhere, this term becomes four times, not twice. So this is the convective part of acceleration we talked about. And that's what makes fluid mechanics problems very challenging. This term, okay, this quadratic term, we cannot get rid of it. There is no way. If you want to talk about inertia force, then this term must be there. There are some special flows in which this term vanishes identically. Okay. So those problems are simpler then. But otherwise, this problem, this term makes the fluid mechanics problems very interesting and very challenging and difficult. Okay. Challenging is the same thing as difficult. We don't use the word difficult, so we use the word challenging. So it's, it's a politically correct terminology, if you want to say that. And it's more pleasing to the everybody else. So, okay. Now, Josh, actually he took the cat out of the bag. He said T I J is symmetric. Yes. Can you find this equation using the second part of the body? Y minus P. I'm sorry? Can you find this equation using the second part of the body? I mean, sure. Y minus P. Because it's not simply connected and you, can, you cannot use the diversion theorem of Gauss. See, remember, this is, this is true for every part P. So you don't take, if the body is not simply connected, that was his question. Not simply connected means the following. I think those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a technical term. Okay? So it's not a, simply connected doesn't mean you connect my shirt to your shirt. Okay? So simply connected means that if you take a close, if you draw a closed curve in the body, you can shrink it to a point without going out of the body. So if I take a pressure vessel, this is the cross section. So this pressure vessel is not simply connected because if I draw a closed curve like this, remember every closed curve I should be able to shrink it to a point without going out of the body. And I, this circle, I cannot close it to a point, or I cannot sorry, shrink it to a point without going out of the body. Because my body does not include this vacuum here. Okay. How now his question is, which is a very valid question, will this Cauchy's law of motion hold for a sphere? Sorry, hold for a cylinder. And the same thing if we say hollow sphere is the same problem. And the answer is yes, because I'm going to take my part P as this one. Okay, I'm not going to take my part P as the one which encloses the 
inner circle, I'm going to take my part P, something like this. Remember, this, this law, balance of linear momentum has to hold for every P. That is the key word, every P. If it were not every P, we could not go to this part. And then we will not have partial differential equations. So the problem, I mean, I'm not saying the problem will be harder to solve. No, we can solve partial integral equations too, like integral partial equations or partial integral equations. We can do it. Okay? Actually, in in a approximate scheme called cellular automata, they don't want to write equations in the partial differential equation form. They want to write equation in the for a cell, which means their part P is more like a cube. Yeah. That's okay. Then, then you don't do this way. Then you don't have to use divergence theorem. You basically go back to the to the form we had before. You go back to this form, and then you can do the approximation scheme on this form, which is fine. Remember, they are all equivalent. So long as you say par every part P. They are equivalent, so you can go back and forth. So the key word is for every part P. And we are assuming, another assumption we are making is that these things are continuous. If delta Tij over delta Xj, which is the derivative, partial derivative of stress, Cauchy stress, if it were not continuous, then we could not derive that this integral, integrand is zero. Remember, when, when I proved this result, I said f is continuous. So, so things have to be continuous. Now, when you're talking about shock waves, sometimes things are not continuous. But we still say this is valid. So you say this is valid on the left side of the shock, this is valid on the right side of the shock, therefore it is, you can, go take the limit from the left side and the right side and you arrive at the shock. Shock means there is there's a discontinuity. Shock is the same thing as saying I'm going to cut this into two pieces. Remember I told you in the, on the very first day, our, we cannot solve this problem. Like if I take this sheet of paper, I cannot, I cannot tear it up. That problem we cannot solve with continuum mechanics we are learning. If I take a closed book, I cannot open it. And if I open it, I can, if I take an open book, I cannot close it. Those problems, we solve them approximately. So, which is the same thing as saying we cheat. But we don't say that word either. We just say we solve them approximately. Because we don't know how to do it. So we, fortunately, the approximations we make, they, they come out, they give results which are close to the experiments. So it's not terribly bad, but that's not what is covered in the theory though. Okay, now, so let's answer Josh's question. Is this Josh, not the other one? Actually, the other one is not here, Josh Strangler. Okay, so the question is the following now. Is this Cauchy stress tensor we talked about symmetric? And in the mechanics of deformed class, what you did to prove that, you basically took a cube and drew the stress components of this and multiplied by the areas to get forces, and then you took the moment about one axis or the other axis. Now, since this is a graduate level course, so we are not going to draw that. We are going to use a similar argument, but not that one. So the, now what we are going to do is use balance of, it's just the same thing, but doing differently. Right? So it's balance of moment of momentum. Now some books might call it balance of angular momentum, but this is really not angular momentum because nothing is rotating. 
Remember, we have only three translational degrees of freedom for a particle. We don't have any rotational degree of freedom for a particle. So the particles are not rotating. They don't have any rotational degrees of freedom. So that's why we, I'm going to say moment of linear momentum. Now, what is the moment of a force? Remember, linear momentum is a vector. So what the, the word, say, the phrase we are using is moment of linear momentum. So how do we take the moment of something? What, how do you take the moment of a force? Is my question making sense? If I give you a, supposing I have this body, here is the point F, like any point, I have a force acting F here, and I want to take the moment of this force, say about this origin. So what do I do? KT has the answer. Go ahead. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell him the answer. So, and you are going to. Oh, I have a question. Go ahead with the question. Well, I was just confused by the terminology because usually you say like moment of an area or moment of a point, and so that's what it's So, like, if you're talking about, are you going to go point out or? Sure, why not point O? I mean, is point O is as good as any other point? Yeah. Or as bad as any other point? So you just do the force times the distance between the point O and the point at which the force is acting? Are you sure? I guess not. <laughs> I mean, what is the distance of point O from the force F? I mean, partially it is correct. Okay. So what is the distance of point O? If you can tell me what is the distance of point O from F, then the answer is yes. I mean, okay, so one way is the following. You extend this and draw this perpendicular, so that's the distance. But I mean, I have infinitely many points now. Right? I mean, this body has infinitely many points. So if I keep on extending those forces, I mean, we won't have dinner tonight. So we got to find something easier. And something easier is, you take this position vector, R, to any point on the force, line of action of the force. And in this case, because the force is acting at this, at this point, so I'm going to take the position vector to that point. But you can take it to any point on the line of action of the force. And if you take the cross product, R cross F, then you get the moment, right? So when you took the moment of area, area is a vector quantity, you found the perpendicular distance, which is really this one, and then you, when well, I could do the same thing, I can say F dotted multiplied with this distance will give me the moment. But then that will give you the moment about this axis. Okay, now I'm getting moment about every axis, like all three axes. So it's a vector quantity. And we also learned that if I want to write the ith component of this, how do I do it? No, this is about a month ago. It's the permutation symbol times. Very good. So R she remembered it. Very good. So she should get a point, extra point. The permutation symbol, and that permutation, that means, I think you are going to say something, but not quite the same thing, though. So that permutation symbol means, this is epsilon, i, j, k, x, j, f, k. And that permutation symbol is like either 1, minus, or minus 1, or 0, depending upon whether i, j, k form an even or an odd permutation of 1, 2, 3. Okay, so that's a review basically. Now we are going to write the balance of linear balance of moment and momentum. So the rate of change of balance of moment and moment, moment of the linear momentum now. So that will be epsilon i j k x j rho d v v k. Rho 
4 times dv is the mass, vk is the component of velocity. Does it make sense? That's the, that is, so this is the rho dv and velocity is the linear momentum. Treat that linear momentum as a force. And now I'm taking the cross product. And if I integrate over the vo volume, I will get the the momentum of linear moment of linear momentum of the whole piece. Is it okay? Because I'm going to the next step now. So now we have the body force. So do the same thing. So take the moment of that. So that's epsilon i j k x j. Body force is rho d v times b i or b k. So this is the body force, moment moment of the body force, plus we have a contact force. So moment of that is epsilon i j k x j f k d a. So all we are doing is writing r cross f for each each of the three terms. Writing r cross f for each one of the three terms. Okay. okay. Any question about this? Now, let us see how good is our recollection of things. And again, that's a fancy word for memory. So what is the first term equal to? So I should not, well, anyway, okay, let me write it. You don't have to rewrite it. What is this equal to? How do I evaluate it? Not what is this equal to, but how do I evaluate it? Okay, my goal is to take d over dt inside, the integral side. That's what I'm after. Take d over dt inside the integral side. So, Will, what should I do now? No, because my p is a function of space time also. So I can't quite immediately take it inside. But we, we did this exercise a oh, couple of days ago, like on Monday. So does anyone recall? P.S. is getting anxious to say something. Go ahead. No, I'm just not sure. OK. So it's d over dt of epsilon i j k x j v k rho d. So what we showed was, what we proved was that d over dt of rho phi dv equals rho d phi over dt of dv. And the person who told me another way to do it, he said we are using conservation of mass, so rho times dv is basically mass, and that is conserved, so that's why we can do all this stuff. Remember, we proved this. So all we are doing now is taking whatever is multiplying rho dv, take that as phi. And it doesn't matter whether it's a scalar or a vector. I think you don't like it. Oh, go ahead. So what exactly is phi in this case? In this case, phi happens to be a vector. So it is really phi i. So I can put i here. That doesn't change anything. Now, 
Now it will take me another maybe five minutes to prove that. So do you want to stay or you want me to continue from here tomorrow? It's up to you. We might lose your connection. Oh, okay. So, okay. We will continue from here tomorrow then. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And we will meet tomorrow in Torgerson Hall. And of course, Wake Forest people have the same room. Well, thank you, Wake Forest also, for coming. Sink it to a point. But here we, u we used just but we are, integral equation. But after that, we said this holds for every P, so we got the local equation. So otherwise, P2 is too big. You can use it, but then again, you are going to shrink it to a point. Thank you. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why it happens. I think I don't have it. I just before you.